For a moment, imagine that you had to invent a story about people who lived in Germany 100 years ago. Fräulein, Sally boys! In order for the story to appear genuine, you'd have to give people the right sort of name that fit the time and place in which they lived. I'm Colonel Klink. So off the top of your head, you might know Hans, Franz, and we want to pump you up. Adolf and Gunther are older German names. But you'd probably peter out after a little while. Hey, Peter. And in order for your story to appear real, you would not only have to get the right names, but you would need to get them in the right proportion and frequency, all without the help of Google. This would be a tough test for your own home state, let alone some faraway land. We are from the land of chocolate. Mmm, the land of chocolate. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today, we're looking at one of the familiar narratives from Richard Bauckham, as told through the lens of YouTuber Testify. So why do I bring this up? Well, skeptics often say that the gospel writers were writing far away long after the events they record. But one way we know the gospel writers were familiar with the setting they're writing about comes in the form of their awareness of personal names. In his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, New Testament scholar Richard Bauckham has created charts of the relative frequency of various personal names in Palestine around the time of Jesus. Bauckham made this argument in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, in which he argues that the canonical gospels are based on eyewitness testimony. Friend of the channel, Camille Greger, recently had an article published in the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus looking at this very argument. And because this argument involves probability theory, I invited my friend Brian, who is a university professor of statistics, to be my co-author and to literally do the math. Hello. The argument is basically this. We know a lot of ancient Jews by name from various literary and archaeological sources. And we actually know so many ancient Jews, I can confirm it's over 9,000, that we can see just how popular their personal names were. For example, Simon was the most popular name, Joseph was a much more popular name than, say, Zenon. And yes, there were in fact first century Jews in Palestine who were named after Zeus. So we can then compare name popularity in ancient Jewish populations with name popularity among named characters in Gospels and Acts to see just how well these two distributions match. Uh, for example, Simon is the most popular name among ancient Palestinian Jews and also the most popular name in Gospels and Acts. Alexander, let's say, is a rare name in the ancient Palestinian Jewish population, and it's also rare in Gospels and Acts, and so on. Bokam argues that when we compare these two distributions, they actually line up pretty well. And from this, he concludes that the name characters in Gospels and Acts actually existed in history, because if a lot of them were invented, the two distributions wouldn't line up so, so well. And this lends support to his overarching thesis that various stories in the Gospels, for example, stories about Jesus healing people or having discussions with people who are named, are based on eyewitness testimony and were not invented together with the personal names in a process of oral transmission. There are several reasons why we decided to look at this argument. First, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses is an incredibly influential book. I collected a sample of some 2,600 books published in Biblical Studies around the same time as Bokam's book. Then I checked how many citations they have, and it turns out that Jesus and the Eyewitnesses is actually the fifth most frequently cited, which is amazing. Also, this argument from name popularity is apparently very influential in apologetics. In the preface to the second edition of Bokam's book, New Testament scholar Simon Gathercall describes how he was at a sermon and the pastor was holding a copy of Jesus and the Eyewitnesses instead of the Bible. And he talked about how this particular argument from name popularity establishes that the Gospels were based on eyewitness testimony. Another reason why I decided to look at this is because scholars have responded to almost everything that Bokam says in his book. But this specific argument from name popularity is a notable exception. Almost nobody has looked at it, and most importantly, scholars sort of seem to trust that Bokam is correct because he's working with numbers, so he must have true conclusions. For example, one reviewer of the book said, the hard data that is utilized definitely gives an authoritative tone to the discussion. And Gathercall says that the pastor, who I mentioned earlier, called it an amazing and original piece of objective research. 
But the most important reason why we decided to write the article is because there's a massive discrepancy between how confident Balcom is in his conclusions and what he actually does with his data. He uses extremely strong expressions to describe what the numbers supposedly show, like, quote, simply could not have, or, quote, could not possibly have, or, quote, it's impossible to explain, etc. But he doesn't do any actual statistical analysis. He only looks at some tables and compares some hand-picked percentages, but, for example, doesn't do any tests for statistical significance, which is the first step you have to take to conclude that something is, quote, very surprising or, quote, difficult to explain. For some quick background, Bakum looked at sources including Josephus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, early rabbinic texts, and ossuaries or bone boxes from around 330 BC to 200 AD, and most of his data came from 50 BC to 135 AD. Before we look at whether Bakum's conclusions actually hold up to scrutiny, we should mention some other issues with his research that are problematic. For example, his data is kind of a mess. He relies on a lexicon of ancient Jewish names, which was put together by other scholars. In the lexicon, every name of every known ancient Jewish person is one entry. Volkam filters this data, for example, he excludes Jews from the diaspora, proselytes, he excludes nicknames, and so on. And then he presents the data in a series of tables, which show how popular each name was. But if you actually check his work, you'll find out that it's impossible to reconstruct his numbers from the lexicon. For example, in his largest table, which shows popularity of male names, a lot of the numbers are actually incorrect. And what you should be seeing on your screen right now is an example of one of his tables, and all the incorrect figures are marked in red. These are either miscalculated or they are typos. In some cases, we can clearly see that the correct number is printed in the next column or row. And this actually leads to some amusing errors. For example, his table says that there are actually four people named Eros in the New Testament. When you compare the findings of Bauckham to the names that we find in the Gospels and Acts, we find a pretty good correlation, especially among the men. So in the Palestinian literature, 15.6 of the men were named Simon or Joseph. In the Gospels and Acts, it's 18.2. 41.5% of the men had one of the most nine popular names, while in the Gospels and Acts, it's 40.3%. We should mention that we were also not able to reconstruct any of the percentages that he uses to compare the names in the Gospels and Acts and in the contemporary population. If you take the figures from his tables and you reproduce the calculations, you get fractions that are different from what he works with in the text. These issues are not fatal, but it seems that Bakum didn't ask anyone to go over his work. And what's more disturbing, this was not noticed in peer review. Almost no scholar commenting on his book noticed either. And even though Bakum says there's hardly anything he would want to change in the text of the second edition of the book, the second edition still has all of these errors. Another issue, and this is much more important, is that Polkam needs to put together a list of named characters in Gospels and Acts so that he can then look at how well name popularity in this sample lines up with what we see in the contemporary population. But it turns out that in order to do that, he needs to make a lot of judgment calls about whether multiple occurrences of the same name are one person or multiple different people. For example, all four Gospels depict Jesus being anointed by a woman. There are similarities between these accounts. For example, it takes place in a house of a person named Simon. Jesus is anointed using perfume and so on. But there are also differences. For example, in some of the Gospels, the woman pours the perfume on Jesus' head. But other Gospels have her anointing his feet. Who objects against this is different in different accounts. Jesus' reply is different and so on. Now the question is this. Is this the same event or are these multiple different events? And it turns out that it depends on which apologist you listen to. Some will insist that it must be the same event because look at all the similarities. But others will insist that it must be two or even three different events because look at all the differences. And this is important, because if it's multiple different events, then you might want to count two different Simons, Simon the leper and Simon the Pharisee. But if it's the same event, then you only have one. And there are many cases like this, actually. Is Alphaeus, father of James, the same person as Alphaeus, father of Levi? Or are these two different people? Is Cleopas in Luke the same person as Cleopas in John? Is Rufus in Mark the same person as Rufus in Romans? Was there just one rebel leader named Theudas, or were there two? And again, it turns out that different apologists, and even different Christian denominations like Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Armenian, and so on, have different takes about who is who in the New Testament. 
And in at least one case, it seems that Volkan's judgment calls about these things get circular. Specifically, his sample of named persons only includes Jews from Palestine. He excludes Jews from the diaspora. Now, you might recall that Acts 6 list seven deacons. Bokam excludes all of them from his sample because he suspects that they were born in the diaspora. Now, he doesn't say why he suspects that, and the text itself doesn't give any indication that this is the case. In fact, it explicitly says that Nikolaos, one of the deacons, is tied to Antioch, which implies that the rest of them are just from Palestine, which is where the scene takes place. But notably, all seven deacons have a Greek name, and it was much more common for diaspora Jews to have Greek names. If this is why Bokam excludes them, it's circular, because the percentage of Palestinian Jews with a Greek name is then one of the indicators that he looks at. And if we put the deacons back into the sample, except for Nikolaos, then suddenly Palestinian Jews with a Greek name in Gospels and Acts become statistically significantly overrepresented compared to the contemporary population. But let's just set all these issues with data collection aside. What we did in the journal article is basically what Bokab should have done in the first place. We took the available data about name popularity, we performed the appropriate statistical analysis, and then we checked whether Bokam's conclusions follow. So how did we do that? What does Bokam actually do to establish his claim that the distribution of names in the Gospel Acts is, quote, remarkably close to the Palestinian Jewish names in the population? He takes the top two most popular names and compares the percentage of the total, and then does the same with the top nine most popular names. He then concludes that the percentages, quote, correlate remarkably closely, close quote, to the population in general. Why the top two and top nine? Those two points are arbitrary. Why only two data points? Again, this is arbitrary. What should one do? No matter what method one uses, one should make use of the entire data set, not a very small self-selected subset. In addition, one needs to account for the uncertainty due to the small sample size. Most statisticians in a problem like this would start with something called the cumulative distribution, and there are some statistical tests based on this. Two of the most common are the kolmogorov smirov test and the kramer von Mises test. You can think of these tests as an extension of what Bakum was attempting, but performing the percentage calculations across the entire data set instead of just on two points, and then making a quantitative comparison for all of the data. Unfortunately, it turns out that these methods don't work when the data has no intrinsic sort ordering. An example with an intrinsic ordering would be the distribution of person heights or weights in a population. The distribution of person names doesn't have a natural order, so the standard tests actually don't work. What we did instead was to think about the texts in the following way. I was a Dungeons and Dragons fan when I was younger, and in that game, they have some very large dice with many sides. So imagine we have one of these large dice with each side labeled with a name, but we change the area of each side to match the proportion of that name in the general population, so more popular names will get rolled more often. This die would have over 400 sides. There are only about 80 total names in the Gospel Acts, so we roll this large die about 80 times noting each name to generate a single simulated text. We then simulate this process hundreds of thousands of times and count how often each name comes up. This allows us to make comparisons across the entire data set, accounting for the uncertainty in having a small number of names, both in the general population data and in the Gospel Acts data. First, it's important to outline what are the two competing hypotheses that we are looking at. Bokam claims that names in Gospels and Acts are in most cases names of actual historical people. The view that he wants to refute is the idea that some of the named persons were invented in a process that he calls anonymous community transmission. Now, it's very important to realize that not all the named people in Gospels and Acts are in contention of being invented in the first place. Not even the biggest proponent of form criticism thinks that, for example, Herod the Great was a fictional character who was invented in a process of some anonymous community transmission, right? Which means that the sample of named characters who are in contention of being fictional in the first place only includes people who are not externally attested, meaning they don't show up in sources other than Gospels and Acts. So let's take, for example, people who are mentioned in the authentic letters of Paul, like Peter, James, or John, or people who are mentioned by Josephus, like John the Baptist, the three high priests, various members of the Herodian family, and so on. Scholars who don't agree with Bokam and don't think that the Gospels and Acts are based on eyewitness testimony 
acknowledge that all of those people actually existed. So if we take the externally attested people out, the sample of contested named characters actually becomes pretty small. It only consists of 32 different male names. And out of these 32 names, 24 names are unique, meaning only one person in Gospels and Acts has that name, and only 8 names have more than one user. Actually, it's only 8 if you're being charitable. It might get less depending on your judgment calls about who is who in Gospels and Acts. With female names, it actually gets much worse. You only have 13 names, and all of them only have one user except for Mary. In fact, the sample size of female names is so small that in our article we just focus on male names because all of the issues that come from that male sample size being too small apply much stronger to female names. Now you might be thinking, okay, so what's the big deal? Couldn't Jews in some foreign country invent some Jewish names that fit the context of first century Palestine? But we can actually run a comparison and see that it wouldn't be at all an easy thing to do. So in Alexandria, Egypt, there was a very high population of Jews, and the most popular names were Eleazar, Sabbatius, Joseph, Dositheus, Pappus, and Ptolemaeus. Outside of Eleazar and Joseph, these other names were not at all popular in Palestine. In Palestine, the most popular names are Simon, Joseph, Eleazar, Judah, Johanan, or John, and Joshua, or Jesus. While we talk about small sample sizes, Bokan makes a big deal out of the fact that in the diaspora, the distribution of name popularity was apparently very different from Palestine. He thinks this is important because he assumes that if invention of names took place in the diaspora, the distribution of name popularity in Gospels and Acts would line up with a name popularity in the diaspora rather than in Palestine. For example, if a lot of characters were invented in a region where the most popular Jewish name was, let's say, Dositchels, then we should expect that name to be very popular in Gospels and Acts. But is that actually the case? A Bokam doesn't give any reasons why we should think this, it just presupposes that this is the case. But what's much more important, all the diaspora names that he uses to compare with Palestine are 45 Jewish names, all of them from Egypt, and 11 of them are from the same town. And from a sample size of only 45, he concludes that if invention of Gospels and Acts characters took place in the diaspora, the appropriate names, and I quote, simply could not have been chosen, and that the distribution of name popularity in Gospels and Acts would be impossible to explain. Now, if you had a sample of 45 observations, you performed no statistical analysis, but you still wrote this in a paper, in any other discipline, you would fail to pass peer review. And if by some miracle you didn't, the rest of the academia in that field would eat you alive. But not in biblical studies, apparently. So if someone were living in another part of the Roman Empire, they wouldn't be able to think of a plausible group of names for Palestinian Jews at this kind of rate unless they got extremely lucky. Remember, no reference works existed for fiction writers to consult to create such a quality of historicity. Okay, so what can we conclude from these small sample sizes if we apply the appropriate methods? Just to reiterate, we only have 8 male names that have more than one user in Gospels and Acts. So, to use the example that Eric gave at the beginning of this video, let's say that we found a text describing events taking place in Germany in 1800s. It has a bunch of personal names. Most of them are old German names, but not all. Almost all of them have only one user in the text, and only a handful of them have more than one user. And all these names that have more than one user are precisely names like Hans, Franz or Adolf, that even an American in 2023 would know. The hypothesis that we are considering is that some of these named characters were invented by people living among German immigrants in Russia in 1850s. It doesn't seem to me that unlikely that those people would also know names like Hans, Franz or Adolf, and that they would be at least somewhat more likely to use those names for any invented characters, rather than names like Ivan, Boris or Vladimir, which were popular in Russia. And so those well-known German names would then appear more often in the text. And this is all it takes to explain the data that we have. And the same is true about Gospels and Acts. All that needs to happen to generate this distribution of name popularity that we see among the contested characters in Gospels and Acts is people to be somewhat more likely 
to give an invented character a popular Palestinian Jewish name rather than an obscure one. And it's not very implausible that this tendency would exist, because the most popular Palestinian Jewish names would of course also be the most well-known Palestinian Jewish names, right? And those would be the most well-known even outside Palestine. So in other words, if you are living in the first century and you are inventing a story about Jesus talking to a Palestinian Jew and you want to give that person a name, it's not very likely that you are going to know some very obscure Palestinian Jewish name. It's much more likely that you are going to know a very popular Palestinian Jewish name like Simon. So it's not surprising that Simon is a popular name both in Gospels and Acts and in the contemporary Palestinian Jewish population. And we should know that Bokam himself actually grants that these eight most popular names are precisely the names that would plausibly be known and used for any invented characters in Palestine. And in the article, we also suggest several additional, let's say, channels of exposure to popular Palestinian Jewish names that would plausibly be present even in the diaspora. For example, first century Palestinian Jews had an extremely strong tendency to give their sons names of the Maccabean leaders. Those are Eleazar or Lazarus, Simon, Joseph, Judas or Jude, that's the same name, John, Matthew and Jonathan. Those sound familiar, right? <laughs> this was basically a form of virtue signaling. It was a way to show support for the Maccabean political project against more Hellenized Jews, who sometimes even had pagan theophoric names like Apollodorus, Demetrios, um, Isidoros, and so on. And given this name-giving practice was so popular, it's not implausible that even people outside Palestine would know that this is stereotypically how Palestinian Jews are named. Next, we know that early Christians in the diaspora were exposed to Palestinian Jewish names because they were exchanging letters and personal visits with Jewish Christians in Palestine. Paul mentions names such as James and John, and those are precisely some of the most popular Palestinian Jewish names. But most importantly, it's possible that gospel authors would of course have sources which would give them at least some indication about relative popularity of Palestinian Jewish names. And these sources include, most importantly, prior Gospels, right? It's not difficult to explain why the name Simon is the most popular name in the Gospel of Matthew. The reason is that it's already the most popular in Gospel of Mark. And it's actually very interesting to notice that in Mark, almost all the occurrences of the most popular names are accounted for by two lists of names. The names of the 12 apostles, and the list of Jesus' brothers. Either of these two lists might be completely or at least partially authentic. And if the subsequent gospel authors, including the author of the Gospel of Mark, had at least a weak tendency to lift appropriately Palestinian Jewish names from either of these two lists, that would explain the data. And the last thing to consider is that Gospels and Acts are actually very uneven about which named characters they include. The author of Mark sort of deposits a, an initial batch of named characters, and then the authors of Matthew and John add only relatively few new named characters. But the author of Luke Acts adds a huge number of named characters who don't show up in any other gospel. So if we ask the question of why the distribution of name popularity in Gospels and Acts lines up so well with the distribution in the Palestinian Jewish population, it's specifically the author of Luke Acts who is to a large degree responsible for this. And again, even New Testament scholars who don't think that the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony argue that it was specifically the author of Luke Acts who was better informed about what was going on in first century Palestine. He knew who ruled where, he knew names of some of the Jewish rebels and so on. So for example, if he used the works of Josephus, which of course contain a lot of named first century Palestinian Jews, it's not difficult to imagine that he would have at least some idea about which names are appropriate to use for any invented Palestinian Jewish characters. So going back to our example of a German text from 1800s, let's again imagine that some characters in it were invented by people living among German immigrants in Russia in 1850s. And let's also imagine that 1850s, it was the case that more than a third of all German names in Germany were named Hans, Franz or Adolf. 
And that the reason why this is so high is because it was a way for Germans to show support for German unification or something like that. Next, let's also imagine that the German immigrants in Russia are exchanging letters and visiting Germans living in Germany, and that the authors of the text in question have access to sources which list German names like Hans, Franz or Adolf. Is it really that surprising that invented characters in that text would be at least somewhat more likely to be given names like Hans, Franz and Adolf instead of Ivan or Boris? And so those names would appear more often in the text, which is analogous to what we see in the Gospels and Acts data. So those are some of the reasons to think that invented characters would be at least somewhat more likely to be given popular Palestinian Jewish names, which would generate a distribution of name popularity that we observe in the data. But it's, of course, very difficult to estimate how much information people in the first century had about relative popularity of names. So what we decided to do instead in the article is basically to dichotomize the two competing views as much as possible, or in other words, create the two most extreme opposite models of name assignment and then check whether these two models produce statistically significant different results. So one extreme scenario is what Balcom imagines, i.e. every named character in the Gospels and Acts actually existed in history. And the most extreme opposite scenario is that all the contested characters in the Gospels and Acts are invented, even entirely uncontroversial ones. And moreover, they were given personal names by people who had absolutely no information about name popularity whatsoever. So basically, they were just picking names randomly out of a hat And so an invented Palestinian Jewish character was no more likely to be named Simon, which was the most popular name, than Apollo Ganes, which was rare among Palestinian Jews. I wonder if people were better at pronouncing that than Apologia. We then compared the statistical distribution of name popularity generated by these two models and asked, is it significantly different? No, it is not. And that's because the size of the sample of contested names is very small. Almost the entire data set, 24 out of 32 male names, are names that only have one user. But that's exactly what we'd expect to see on the most extreme scenario of all names being randomly generated without any information about name popularity. And even for the eight names, which have more than one user, the range of values we would expect to observe on the two most extreme opposite scenarios, they overlap. Even if there was only one Simon in the Gospel and Acts, as opposed to eight, which is the actual number, that still wouldn't be statistically significantly different from what we would expect to observe if Balcom's thesis was true. And again, this is because the sample size is too small. Now, it's of course very easy to imagine a pattern of names which would fit the contemporary population statistically significantly worse than what we observe in Gospels and Acts. For example, let's imagine that every single character in the Gospels was named Jesus. That would be pretty crazy, right? That wouldn't be historically plausible. But that would also be inconsistent with the most extreme negation of Bolkan's thesis. If we observed that, there would have to be some substantive reason why every character was given the name Jesus. You wouldn't get that by just randomly picking names out of a hat. And absent any substantive reasons like that, the two most extreme opposite scenarios that we model are not empirically distinguishable given the limited data that we have available. And this is true even when we use the appropriately robust statistical analysis and we don't just look at some tables and percentages like BOCA. And bear in mind that the two models that we are comparing are extremes, which means that if these two extremes are not empirically distinguishable, then any less extreme and therefore more historically plausible scenarios, like a scenario in which most Gospels and Acts characters are historical, but some are invented, is not going to be empirically distinguishable either. But it gets better. We actually found some evidence against Balcom's thesis. Specifically, we found out that characters with rare names, which means names that are only ever known to have one user, are statistically significantly underrepresented in Gospels and Acts. Specifically, there are four rare names in the Gospels and Acts, and the probability that the number would be so low if Balcom's thesis was true is only about 1%. You can see just how improbable this is on the screen right now. In other words, if the distribution of name popularity followed the distribution in the contemporary Palestinian Jewish population, we would expect to see more than four characters with rare names in the Gospel and Acts, and the probability that there would only be four is very small. On the other hand, 
three out of the five most popular names in Gospel Acts are overrepresented compared to the contemporary population. We have too many Simons, too many James, and too many Josephs. So what explains that? Bogan's thesis cannot offer any explanation. And if it's true, the probability that this would occur randomly is extremely small. But I can come up with an explanation. How about this? Rare names were less likely to be known and therefore less likely to be used for invented characters to the advantage of more popular and therefore more well-known names. That would explain it, right? So yeah, that's called evidence. <laughs> that's some evidence that some of the named characters in Gospels and Acts are probably invented. And let's finish with a sneak preview of something which we haven't published yet because we couldn't fit all of it into just one journal article. Bokam says that if there were invented characters in Gospels and Acts, the distribution of name popularity wouldn't line up with the contemporary population. So maybe the most obvious way to test whether this is true is to look at names of fictional characters appearing in other ancient works. What if we have a textual corpus that contains not just some, but very many fictional characters. Is the distribution of name popularity in that corpus statistically significantly worse than what we see in Gospels and Acts? And in order to test that, we constructed three textual corpora. The first is Gospels and Acts. The second consists of several Christian apocryphal works that have a large number of fictional named first century Palestinian Jews, for example, names of the shepherds that were attending Jesus' birth. And the third one is the Babylonian Talmud, because it turns out that there is a lot of fictional people in the Talmud. For example, I'm not sure if you know this, but the reason why the Romans destroyed the second temple is because a slave confused two people with the same name and delivered a party invitation to a wrong house. So is the distribution of name popularity statistically significantly better in Gospels and Acts than in the other two corpora that include a lot of fictional characters? Well, no, it's not. In some respects, the distribution is actually worse because the Apocrypha and the Talmud don't have some of the disproportional representations of rare and popular names that I talked about. And just to illustrate that you can't really use this data to detect historicity, I'm going to show you three charts which display the same information for Gospels and Acts, for the Corpus of Christian Apocrypha, and for the Babylonian Talmud. Specifically, this shows the number of people in the given corpus who have a given name. That's shown as the white diamonds. And then it shows a 95% confidence interval of how many persons with that name we should observe if Bokam's thesis is true. That's shown as a vertical error bar. Now I remove chart titles and your job is to tell me which one of these charts is Gospels and Acts. Because remember, if Bokam is correct, two of the three charts should stand out. Many of the diamonds should fall outside these intervals. Because the Gospels and Acts are presumably the only corpus that doesn't have many fictional characters in it. So can you guess which one of these three charts is Gospels and Acts? As you can see, there is no detectable difference. Because you just can't detect the presence of even a large number of fictional characters this way. For all we know, there's also a large number of fictional characters in Gospels and Acts, just like there are in the Apocrypha and in the Talmud. And if this is the case, not even the appropriate statistical analysis allows us to discover this. And I'm actually not going to tell you which chart is Gospels and Acts. You will just have to wait for the second article to come out. So to reiterate, when we re-examined Baucom's argument using the appropriate statistical methods, we discovered not only that his conclusions don't follow, but we even found some evidence against his thesis, or in other words, some evidence that some of the named characters in the Gospels and Acts are probably invented. And if you use Baucom's approach and compare Gospels and Acts to other ancient works that do have a lot of fictional characters in them, they are not recognizably different. And bear in mind that the reason why we decided to write this article is because Bokam himself is extremely confident in his own conclusions. But when you then fact check him, you discover that what he says doesn't actually follow from his data. His book has been out for some 17 years now. It's very heavily cited 
It's apparently very influential in Christian apologetics. Uh, a researcher looked at all the names of, 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 of men and women, Jewish men and women in the first century. Then it turns out the most popular names for Jewish men in Egypt in the first century were very different than the most popular names for men, Jewish men in Israel. And it turns out when you do all the study that the gospel authors get it right. They just happen to know what the most popular names for men and women were in the first century in Israel. Well, why do they know? Because they're actually reporting it at the time as they knew it. But almost nobody has bothered to fact check him. And the argument from name popularity is not the only part of the book that's this flawed. It's not that these issues exist only because Bochum isn't a professional statistician, which wouldn't excuse him anyway, of course. I'm not a statistician either. That's why I asked Brian for help. Other parts of Jesus and the eyewitnesses have other problems that also haven't been pointed out yet. In fact, I'm writing a third article right now about a completely different part of the book that hasn't been responded to, which doesn't have anything to do with personal names or statistics. And just to be clear, Richard Bolkam is a legitimate New Testament scholar. He is no Frank Turek. And I agree with many of his positions. For example, I agree that the Gospel of Matthew was not written by Matthew. But let's be real. He's also a darling of evangelical apologists. And one of the main reasons why I personally think that Jesus is dead is because when I ask apologists who are the best qualified scholars who make the best case for why I should believe the New Testament when it says that Jesus is alive. The scholars that I get recommended are people like Richard Polka, like N.T. Wright, Craig Keener, Greg Blomberg, or Ben Witherington, Mike Lacona, and so on. Not to mention, of course, non-specialists like Lee Strobel, J. Warner Wallace, or Lydia McGrew. Every time someone like Sean McDowell or Michael Jones points me to these people, my reaction is, if this is the best you've got, then I'm good. Thanks, Camille. Thanks, Brian. You can find their article linked in the description of this video, as well as a link to Camille's YouTube channel. As a special treat, Camille and Brian are going to be doing a much more extensive deep dive on this paper, its findings, and the veracity of Bauckham's argument over on Myth Vision Podcast. So tap on the thumbnail on screen now to catch it live soon, or on replay if it's already happened. I will definitely see you over there. Until next time, later. Thank you.